Hello and welcome to Pharma Television News Review here in Munich at Bayer Europe 2010. On this show, I have Klaus Schoper, who is Senior Vice President of Client Relations at Rentschler Biotechnology. Happy to be here. Uh, Klaus, uh, Rentschler is, a, is now um, a, quite a famous company. It's very, very well known as a, as a company involved in manufacturing biologics particularly. Um, but could you tell us just a little bit about the history of Rentschler and how it developed over the years? Because it's quite an old company. Indeed it is. I mean, we were founded, you wouldn't believe that, way back in 1927. Obviously not as a biotech company, but as a traditional pharmaceutical company, a local company, founded by uh, what was the grandfather of our current uh, CEO, together with his brother. They developed the idea of uh, producing medicines in, on an industrial level and came out with a variety of uh, what we would call today over-the-counter drugs, which they produced. And the company has been involved into all sorts of different areas. After the war, we were to some extent involved in vaccines, in animal vaccines. And out of that developed the idea in the 70s to get into interferons, which was really the foundation of uh, Rentschler Biotechnology or Biotechnology as it is today. And so we then had for more than 20 years a history of interferon developments. We were the first company that ever got an interferon product approved worldwide in Germany, that was. Not by made by recombinant DNA technology, but by cell culture of human cells, which were induced to produce interferon, and then that interferon was harvested and purified. Product is still on the market called Fiblaferon in Germany, as licensed for uh, viral infections. Well, and then in the late 90s, we sort of uh, were looking strategic review what to do with this business, and then we developed the concept of uh, no longer going after own proprietary products. Uh, but to take our assets, take our knowledge and everything and offer that to third parties as a service. And uh, so since then we've been providing services to the uh, biotech and biopharmaceutical industry. And that has laid the foundation of a very nice growth path of the company. At that time we were less than 100 people. Now we are more than 600. Um, our revenues have gone up to close to 80 million euro nowadays. So there's been a very nice and constant growth, organic growth, all over the years with tremendous uh, expansion, uh, new facilities and a lot of uh, commitment from our shareholders, which still is the Rentschler family, basically, to invest all sorts of monies into, into this business. At the same time, we divested all the other business lines, including what was the foundation of, of Rentschler as a company, including our OTC products, which went away in 2006. So nowadays, we are 100% CMO, 100% service company for the biopharmaceutical industry and we think this is a very good business position and uh, we like what we do. Right. So th but what's, what's interesting about that history is how the company's adapted over time to, to the various market opportunities. Right. So it has followed in a sense the pharmaceutical industry itself. Uh, obviously the, the importance of biologics way back even in the 70s were important, Correct. identified that. So um, now clearly it has built up this reputation in the area of, uh, of, of, of particularly biologics um, uh, as, a, as a CMO. When you were now, of course, in, in, in 2010, um, bio, biologics are a very important part of the market, pharmaceutical market, mm -hmm. and, and lots of pharmaceutical companies would like to have more biologics. Uh, what is the advantage for a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company to go to a company like Rentschler for its, for its, for its manufacturing? What, why, should they, why should they even consider it? Well, I guess for some it's they have no choice. For some, the majority of you know, our clients come from the small middle biotech segment and those are companies that just don't have enough of a, a pipeline or a product portfolio to support own manufacturing infrastructure. So when it comes to GMP manufacturing of proteins using recombinant technologies and cell culture, they, and in, under GMP, they are just completely dependent on a, a service provider that has the experience and the expertise to doing that. Otherwise, they would have to spend a lot of money you know, for building up that infrastructure themselves. It would put, set them back by many years. They would not be sure whether they can utilize uh, the infrastructure that they're building up, so they would be left with huge investments 
and the uncertainty of whether this will be utilized or not. Not a, not a smart business decision, frankly. So it's much better to turn to somebody who has that infrastructure, who has the experience, who has the expertise, and who can reliably uh, and with a good track record, pro track record provide such a company with uh, the products in GMP quality. Right. And then, of course, there are the other companies. We also have bigger companies and even what we would call big pharma on our client list. And those, for those companies, it is uh, something that well, just, they sometimes just have bottlenecks. And if they just wait uh, you know, until they have capacity themselves to deal with the project, that would put the project behind. If they can't handle them themselves internally, they, they go for outsourcing. So, so when it comes to um, the business of Rentschler, um, what is the scope of its, of its abilities? I mean, obviously, uh, you've got animal mammalian cell culture capabilities, right. but that, does that include microbial systems and so forth? So what's the, what's the scope? Okay, we do not work with microbial systems. We focus entirely on mammalian cells. But everything around mammalian cells, starting from cell line development, process development, GMP manufacturing, fill and finish, formulation development, analytical service, stability studies, pretty much everything that is in the CMC area, you, we can provide as a one-stop shop. If it comes to microbes, we pass. Then, okay. then this is not, not our business. But if it's mammalian cells and, and 80, 90 percent is CHO based today, that's really what we know well and what we can do. And, and the expression systems that you use, are they proprietary to you or do you use other people's expression systems? We, we use our own expression system and we also use other people's expression systems. Um, we have a collaboration with Boeing and Ingelheim, so we have access to their BIX system um, through that collaboration. But we also have uh, customers who team up with um, companies uh, that provide such expression systems and they, they license them in, they use the technology and then they come. We also run, uh, for example, a manufacturer protein that's based on the Lonza GS system. So, I mean, all of these systems, uh, it, then of course the client has to make sure that they got the freedom to operate. We don't have uh, any licenses ourselves to, right. to, to such systems. Okay. So in other words, it's reasonably, you're reasonably flexible within yes. with one, what you can do with those. In fact, with we those. are very flexible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you, you you also described how uh, you know you you provide these services just beyond being a core um, CMO, you the analytical services yes. and so forth. Yeah. Um, so from from a Rentschler point of view, how do you see the market changing? I mean the 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 the, the industry, um, you know, biologics as we just said, you know, is much more accepted. There are mm. blockbuster drugs mm. these mm. days. So, so, you know, have you, what sort of changes have you seen recently that, that tells you that the world is, is changing and, and particularly in the area of biologics? Well, I mean, we obviously more and more companies, pharma, traditional pharma companies that in the past were really focusing on small molecules have now turned to biologics. So there is more and more demand for products based on, on, on biologics, yeah, biological products. And uh, they, uh, those products are not generated just through in-house discovery, but a lot uh, you know, of these companies work through collaborations with small startups. And that has created a whole industry of startups, as you know. And I mean, those, and there's more and more of those and uh, more and more uh, uh, companies around products. And those products then, as I, as I earlier said, are really dependent on, they want to get into the clinic, they want to show proof of concept for their molecule. Sure. And for this, they need uh, product GMP quality, and for this, they need a CMO because they just don't have the experience or the infrastructure so you, you, themselves. So you provide clinical you, yes. um, yeah. materials. Yeah, right? actually, for the majority of what we do is for is work for investigational medicine products. We have a couple of products that are on the market that that, people, that we provide, but the majority is really for these investigational medicinal products, okay. and the demand is uh, still increasing for those. Right. And uh, as we see the transformation of the industry, obviously biotech companies are finding it more difficult to get funding these days. Mm -hmm. is, has that had an effect on, on, on I mean, your we, company? Not really, I must say. I mean, we've, we've had constant demand for the type of services because, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is in need for new products. They, I mean, there will be patent expiries and the likes, you know, so they have to replace mature products by new products. This is, they're, they're in this, they're trapped in, in this, if you want. So, and in-house discovery doesn't provide enough molecules, so they go elsewhere. 
and and therefore I mean other companies are out there obviously the the, uh, the pharma companies and the investors have become more selective so not every business idea gets funded as was maybe at the beginning of the decade but uh, good and sound business ideas with with good uh, well, uh, proven biology behind that uh, still get get fund don't have problems getting funded that's what we experience and I'm, I'm sure some companies may have asked you would you be prepared to take some of the risk in in, in taking some of these products forward yeah that question gets we get we, uh, comes up every once in a while and what's and the answer the answer is no we don't do that I mean this would mean that Rentschler apart from being a as a CMO would also become an investor and we don't have first of all we don't have the experience and the uh, and in, in the expertise to evaluating on you know, these these opportunities and then finding out you know what would be a good return or, or whatever we, we don't have the the expertise in the pathology we don't have the expertise in the disease area and we cannot really judge, um, you know, what is the, the probability of success of such a, a, a project. I mean, what we deliver, we, we know very well and we can control. But when it comes to the to the pharmacology, to the disease model, we're pretty naive. Yeah. And we would need that expertise in order to really e evaluate this, this opportunity. And then, of course, it's, to some extent, it could also compromise our independence. Sure. I mean, we are, you know... It, some, sometimes my project managers ask me, Klaus, what are the top priority product projects, what are the low priority projects? And I say, I can't tell you. For me, all projects are of equal importance because every customer is of equal importance. If we come to a situation where we have constraints and we have to make choices, we will make decisions inevitably. But I'm not slating a particular project as a low priority project right from the beginning because that would mean that this project always will suffer. So. And I really want to be want to retain that independence. I don't want to have you know stakes or a vested interest in a particular project. And if we were investing in one of them, that would be the case. So I'm I'm really reluctant, and we want to stay away from that. Okay. So um, obviously, most of the companies that come to you are, are are product with products which are innovative. The whole area of biosimilars is, is a, a subject of, yes. of a topic of and, interest. And we have no problems in, we, we, we have already run several biosimilar projects for clients. We have no problems in doing that. We respect uh, obviously confidentialities and, and there are always certain exclusivity arrangements that go together with that. That's fine for the time as, as we perform work. For a biosimilar molecule for one party, we would not work for, for another party at the same time, that's clear. But we also have no problems in, in doing such projects, and we've done some of them already. Right. So they have the equal priority to all the other projects that Absolutely. come through yeah. as well. Yeah. And do you see that as a growing part of your business? It will eventually come. I mean, uh, now there are some interesting products uh, out there where the patents will expire. And they've, those products have, are they're really blockbusters. So there is obviously an, an interest in coming with follower molecules. If you know things like personalized medicine or so will kick in, then we will probably in the future have less of the blockbusters, and so it will be uh, pr uh, more products that have a very specific market and not such a high volume. Then the question will be: Well, can can you still afford uh, doing a biosimilar version of that particular molecule? Because it's completely different game to develop a biosimilar as composed uh, as opposed to developing a. Uh, a, a, a generic small molecule. I mean, this is the the investment is by far higher, so it's only very few companies can afford that. And the question is, do you get back what you have to invest? So that, but that's further down the road. For the time being, I think there are some very interesting opportunities out there of um, company of, of products that will expire over the next six to eight years, and uh, and I'm sure some the companies are already working on those. Yeah. <laughs> And the other issue, of course, because you're you're involved in producing proteins um, for, for for companies, one of the issues that they have to face is is formulation and delivery. Yes. Yeah. So does your do your services extend into providing solutions to some extent for formulation and, and I mean, delivery? We have recently built up in-house expertise to at least be able to provide our customers with liquid formulations for proteins. 
that are suitable for early stage clinical development. And that's and the, the, the reason for that being simply that we can expedite the development to that extent and will not that this doesn't end up on the critical path. So time to market, oh not time to market, time to proof of concept is so important for most of our clients and we felt okay if we can do something else to speed this up then we will we will jump into that. We are not a drug delivery company, we're not a protein delivery company. If specialized, uh, if, if the client has special requirements for that, uh, we work with other companies as partners. We have, uh, you know, good relationships to some of these companies that are active in this area, and we uh, we're happy to refer our customer to such companies. And but uh, we do fill and finish of liquid formulations and uh, and pre-filled syringes. We offer that as a stand, as a regular service, also as a standalone service. Um, okay, so. What's the future then? I mean, for 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 companies like yours, obviously there's continued growth in the in in the bi area of biologics. Mm. Mm. Where do you see your future growth? Well, interestingly, we're just at the point where we are having an internal discussion about that, and so the question on the table is: Will we be manufacturing proteins in twenty years down the road? In two thousand twenty-seven, Rentschler will become a hundred years, right? So we're. We have an internal project, you know, workshop 2027, uh, to remind ourselves that this is not that far away. I personally will be retired by then, but that's right. not the problem. So this is this is indeed what we're looking at. Is this going in which direction? Is this going? Is this going into uh, vaccines? Is it going into cell therapy, gene therapy? So we're watching these developments very carefully, and uh, we will move, try to move very quickly if any of these things. Technologies become so mature that there will be a significant demand for them in the marketplace. That's definitely some of the things that we're we're looking at. We haven't made any decisions yet, but we are carefully watching what's going on in the industry. Klaus Schöper, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. It was great. Thanks a lot. Hello.